Hi guys, another episode of the Altitude and Trails podcast. It's been in a while, I have to say, but we have some surprises coming in the, in the upcoming future. And uh, here we are with Dominic, and um, it's going to be a strange situation for both of us. We're going to discover a little bit more about what happened and what is happening. Uh, hi, Dominic, how are you? I, I'm very good. And nice to see you. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, before we start, I always uh, ask a little introduction uh, from any any guest that we had on this podcast, so people can understand what kind of person we have in, on the screen today. So who is Dominic? Right. I am a half South African, half Australian. I live in Sweden. I've been there for 20 years, uh, but have lived in both the other countries as well. I am a, a you know mother, wife worker and a hunter i um have a couple of sound, dogs yeah. i have a couple of dogs i have a uh, bavarian mountain hound i do a lot of tracking of wounded game with her which i do both uh, for hunters and sometimes in traffic as well and i also have a german shorthead pointer who we primarily hunt birds with uh, that is the short story interesting Interesting. I'm also a biologist originally, although I don't work with that anymore. Uh, wow. So that also ties into my um, whole hunting story. That's a lot, actually. That's a lot. That's because so, I'm getting older. <laughs> I've had Come time. on. Come on. <laughs> so, guys, um, for the followers, Instagram, Chili Teeth. It's uh, the nickname. And uh, you can go and just surf up uh, between the pictures. Uh, she has uh, amazing photos from uh, the different trips. The, all the stories are exciting. So you should follow this interest and see um, all the upcoming content as well. Because she's right now in, uh, yeah, probably you would, we're going to see some wildlife behind me. <laughs> uh, we are in... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we just we just have spotted a little chamois behind them. So, and um, anyway, it it will be tough this podcast, but it's good. So we have to uh, contextualize a little bit our our um, podcast now. You are in Australia right now, right? That is correct. I'm in Perth, which is the West End. And how did you get there? Well, uh, more by arse than class, I would say. I am, being an Australian, I am between jobs at the moment, so currently not working, but I have family down here, I have property down here, I have a lot of interest down here, of course. And um, I decided, ah, okay, well, I have the time, I have the chance, let me get myself back to Australia and spend some time in my place. And uh, so I managed to land myself a ticket to get down here at sort of two weeks notice, um, and down I came. And so here I am sitting in the compulsory quarantine that the Australians have because of COVID. And I'm actually quite amazed that I got here at all because I didn't realize until I got here how much people are struggling to get back home. Uh, so, yeah. But I will be here for about three months, spending a lot of time with my brother and his family, um, which I cannot wait to see my small niece and spend some time with her. I will hopefully be getting out to do a bit of shooting uh so i'm looking forward to that and uh travel around this state it's massive i mean it's almost half australia and there is some pretty awesome stuff to see in this neck of the woods nice nice so what happened guys is that we are friends since a while on social and um we started to chat again and uh the situation was kind of weird she's in australia and we are in christchurch in new zealand in the same situation, same quarantine, same protocol. And that, that was strange. That, that was funny, actually. Yeah. So she's probably getting out of the quarantine before us of what? Probably by three, four days? Saturday. 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 Yeah. Okay. okay. We're, we are scheduled for Monday if the second ah. test is going to be negative. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. So 
it's kind of yeah, it's still weird to, to think that we we are in the same situation. Uh, how strange is the world, you know? That we we started to chat, and and actually you, you were flying to Australia, and 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 same for us, for my family to to New Zealand. Um, what do you think about this situation? About getting that far overseas, and now you have to experience this quarantine. What are your feeling about this? I mean, I think for me, I have chosen this very voluntarily with eyes wide open. I knew exactly what I was going in for. I knew I was going to get locked up for two weeks with no fresh air. I knew that I would not be able to set foot outside my room. I knew it was total isolation. And I have a fantastic trip waiting for me on the other side of it. So, you know, I think for me, it's a case of like, okay, yep, it's going to cost me in a bit of time. It's going to cost me a bucket of money and it's going to be worth it. Uh, so, I mean, from, from my side, it's fine. I've, you know, I've planned it out. I have a quite a rigid training routine that I stick to and I have a bunch of stuff that I wanted to learn. So I'm just kind of doing the whole cliche better myself thing during these two weeks. But I have thought a lot about people who have landed in this involuntarily. I mean, imagine yourself in a situation where maybe you're stuck overseas working, maybe you aren't working, maybe you have to get home. Suddenly a parent dies, you need to get home, you can't afford it, you find a ticket. You find one, it costs you 50,000 crowns. You know, there's a lot of reasons why this could be very, very tough for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so, I mean, I feel like I'm all good, but I don't envy some other people um, who probably yeah. have quite a rough trot of it, I would say. I mean, just you guys with your kids. I mean, how on earth do you guys keep the kids occupied? Uh, most of the time, I, I turn myself in a, in a horse so my my daughter is practicing uh horse riding on my back even if i can have an that... well, sorry can we get a demonstration <laughs> uh, not not now because i'm stuck here i can't move all the cables behind my feet uh, so i can't, i can't remove from this situation from the position sorry so yeah so i do horse riding for uh, probably a couple hours a day uh we are not doing dressage for the moment so i think it's fine <laughs> what are you doing jumping over the furniture or what? <laughs> you, you do know that you have to put a clip of this up later <laughs> yeah. so it's tough it's tough it's not it's not easy because there are two and so sometimes one gets sleepy and the other one try to wake it wake, wake up the the sister but I think that's what you said. Uh, we still see from a perspective there are a lot of more situations that are not that lucky like ours. And uh, so we keep going. We know that actually at the end will be something good as something good that is waiting for us. So yeah. that's a good there's a good goal. Uh, so now let's let's go a little bit into this quarantine probably you know people that are listening it's it's not a thing that happen every day right no so can you describe a little bit how is living this quarantine for 14 days um yeah let's 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 discover a little bit well i mean given that you know i have um you know you get everything you need you have to pay for it yourself to start with so that's one thing you need to know if you're gonna come here um that's a good thing because a lot of people I, I have received some messages and say that, oh, that's super nice. They've seen the, the, the room and stuff. They say, wow, the state does a good job. I say, no, guys, actually, uh, you have to pay. Yeah. For that. yeah. I mean, the thing is, there's a mass. I mean, if we back up to even before the quarantine, I mean, the whole experience from leaving Europe was really quite surrealistic, I would say. I don't know what it was like for you guys, but when I flew from Stockholm to Frankfurt and then Singapore and down, and from Frankfurt on, it was, it was just strange. It was like stepping into a film script. Um, mm. I mean, the plane I was on, the section I was sitting in would have normally seated maybe 160 people. There were seven of us on, in that section. There were none in the section in front of us. And at the same time, I know there's thousands and thousands of people trying to get back to Australia or yeah. New Zealand or whatever. Um, and, you know, everybody is sort of keeping as far away from each other as possible. And you know, as you should, social distancing, but you kind of get the feeling that everybody is trying to stay away from each other because they think everybody else is trying to kill them. It's like that feeling yeah. you get, you know. And, then, and then, you know, so there's this empty plane that you're flying on. In the middle of the flight, we hit massive turbulence, threw me out my seat. And I was just like, this really feels like a movie script. Uh, 
landed in Singapore, you get put into that quarantine thing. I think you guys landed there where you put into kind of a holding pen for the transit passengers. And um, that was also just like weird walking around feeling like a goldfish in a bowl, like round, round, round that thing. And then you get here and here it was, I think I had to show my passport not less than 10 or 12 times. I had three different quizzes as to why I was here. I had, um, you know, two hand gel sessions, face mask swap, a face mask swap uh, temperature taking, one stop with the police who just informed me of where I was going. Another stop with the police who checked my, my entry uh, fulfillment that I had the rights, everything's in place to be able to come into the country. And then a third stop with the police where they just kind of read the whole law and telling you, you know, what punishments you can get and how much jail you can get and what sort of sentence wow. you can get if you break quarantine. And then from there, they sort of herded us back out onto the tarmac where the planes were parked with police all the way along into buses and then a blue light escort all the way into town. Um, and when we got to town in the buses, then they'd load you off at the hotel and there's military staff standing between the buses and the hotel. So I think there must have had situations where people have tried to do a runner from the bus. Otherwise, That's... there'd be no reason to have that. Yeah. But, so, you know, you wow. had, you had, this whole feeling was, it was really quite quite sort of apocalypse kind of everything's about to all fall down kind of thing um and then from there you just went through checked in up to the room closed the door boom and there you sit for 14 days so wow. but i had um i mean i have i have my morning i keep my day quite organized because i'm you know incurably social i do not like being all on my own so so i have um in the I get up in the morning. There's a there's a fantastic guy in quarantine in Sydney who happens to have the same quarantine period as I do, and I happened to see on Facebook the first day that I was here that he was running online training classes. Now he's a professional dancer and trainer, so he sets up like two, three to four training classes every single day that anybody in quarantine can join, and that's turned into quite a fun thing, and it's a kind of a anchor point to work your day around. And, um, and I've thought a lot about that. It's like, you know, it's funny how people can, people are innately social creatures. I mean, you can talk all of us who hunt and all of us who, you know, need to get out the bush, talk about how we need to have the time, down, downtime to think and to, you know, recharge our batteries and stuff. But put any one of us involuntarily into isolation and people are like, oh, people, give me people, I need people, you know. Uh, so it's been quite interesting to see how that sort of thing happens in a situation like this. So, so I mean, my day, basically, I get up in the morning, I train at six o'clock, I eat breakfast, I train again, then I do a bunch of online courses and stuff, and then I do another training session in the afternoon. I talk to heaps of people back from Sweden and people from here, um, and then the day is done. Wow. It's, so, it's, uh, it, it's kind of busy, busy day. It is. It's funny. I was telling my mates back home that I don't have time to do the stuff that I wanted to. And they were like, how is that even possible? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's been so nice. It's funny because, I mean, this whole thing about social media, it can be such a gift sometimes. Um, yes. You know, I've had people jump out the woodwork that I didn't even know existed, who have been a, a couple of Australians, actually, you know, who's like, hey, are you all right? You know, and they will write to me every single day and just check that I'm okay. Uh, nice. Even though they owe me nothing, I don't know them. It's it's so nice. Yeah, so, that's yeah. a power source of network. You, uh, it's um, unbelievable how, how many people you can interact with. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's there's you know a flip side of everything and a arse end of everything, including social media. But used right, it's fantastic. And I mean, this has really shown up a gold side for me this time. So it's been nice. Okay. Then I, I yeah, I see a little difference be, uh, between the two protocols and process. When when we reach a year, the military were coordinating the the transport and uh, the arrival as well, but was really fluid, uh, calm, quiet, um we reached the hotel there was this uh this um this military guy that just uh, was describing a little bit the, the protocol and the hotel what was going to happen but it was super calm it was really um uh, just making a, a huge you know status of uh quietness and that was mm -hmm. good especially on this period you know people can get can freak out and uh <laughs> 
yeah, because we are not used to this. So, and then we reached the hotel. That that's it. I mean, that was. I mean, that was good. I I I was impressed. And this, I think, is the way to to manage this kind of situation. But probably it's because nothing really bad happened. Probably people, you know, just stick to the to the to the protocol, and they didn't, you know, make any 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 anything stupid. Yeah, but... uh, and I mean, I wouldn't say that it was, you know, stressful or aggressive or angry or anything like that, but it was a very large sort of machinery that they had in place, and yeah. there were a lot of police and military around. So yeah. I think they've had probably a couple, well, I know there's been a couple of situations where people have sort of tried to duck yeah. out and had to have people on the spot then. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So there's another question that it's uh, really important to me. Uh, what about the food? The food? Oh, you know what? <clears throat> I sort of, I thought about it and I was like, well, I could, you know, do the whole Uber Eats thing, order in heaps of my own food, buy heaps of stuff. And I was like, or I could make it a principal thing that I can do this because I'm not a spoiled brat. <laughs> so, so, so I have not ordered anything. I have not bought anything from their web places, nothing like that. You should see what people are buying. It's ridiculous. People are buying microwaves, they're buying treadmills, they're buying exercise bikes. They are spending hundreds of dollars on food when they have plenty of food coming through, they just happen to not like it. Yeah, so the question yeah, so is what happened to that their food? It's a, it's a bit of a principal thing to me. I eat, you know, the food is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not gourmet food, but I mean, tell me one company in the whole world that can deliver top shelf gourmet food under these conditions. Exactly. I mean, imagine all the protocol that their staff have to follow to get the stuff to us without coming into contact with us. Uh, you know, it's funny. I always try to get to the door when they knock and leave the food outside the door and see if I can see them. I have not yet been able to see them. I swear they're ninjas. <laughs> It's like... Me too. I I was just behind <laughs> because I, I knew more or less the time, you know. The it's like when you're starting to spot some animals, you know, the roaming patterns. I, mm -hmm. I understood. I don't know if it's a woman or if it's a guy, and I, more or less it's just the the range of time. So you know, in the evening you're spotting a yeah. roebuck, you know, from, and I, said, I was just behind the the door like this, and so let's see if I can hear, and I just put my hand behind. <laughs> so funny it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like I, everybody <laughs> uh, and i went one second to probably check one of my daughter just with five meters and then pop, pop, so i run i rush i rush to the door and i wanted to see that man that just delivered the food Miss, no. No, i can't I'm understand you, i call them the dinner ninjas because i never see them you know what? This is a challenge. If you can get a picture with your phone, to, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You call that in English, but you know, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that's gonna be like a thousand dollars picture. So challenge accepted. Nice. I, have I, will, <laughs> I will try the same. I will try the same, but I, I think I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get it. Um, food is good. Food is good. I have to say that there was uh, pork, meat. There's a lot of choices. Uh, so um, you want to eat vegetarian, you want to eat meat, you want, and that's is it covers a lot of meats, uh, fruits, salads, uh, a lot of dessert. I I never seen so much dessert in my life. Yeah, um, no, I don't so eat I, it because I just feel shit. I know, so. and the thing is that. My situation is a little bit more tough because uh, with daughters they start and then they look at me like, uh, "Papa, can you just uh, yeah finish it?" And otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw it. So I, I'm doing the horse, and the half of the other time I'm trying to 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 be in rubbish, you know. Being this Papa is the bean. We're gonna put all the things that we cannot finish. Boom, boom, boom. So okay. I'm I'm getting out of shape. That's gonna be a problem. So I I hope it's gonna be soon on some Becca Becca country, so we can just get rid of those calories. Yeah, yeah. So I think and, I think it's easier being on your own in a situation like this, as long as you're prepared for your own company. I think for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So do you have some hours where you can get out of your room? You can just walk a little bit on the restricted areas. Nothing. 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 It's like in the door, wow. close the door. 
that's it. Wow. So it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it's kind of strange, you know, that we arrived here and then there is a, a type of uh, organization I would call that uh, really check about if uh, people are mentally uh, healthy, mm -hmm. especially yeah. during this period. And they call yeah. us a lot of times and now they know there are two girls that they ask us if the girls want to go outside. And we decided because we've seen some outbreaks a little bit, uh, one, our flight had a couple of positive. Yeah, you said that. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, there was another outbreak that I, I I got those news by some friends from local friends. So I said, look, it's going to be difficult. I, I said to my wife, it's going outside. She actually said that. But the kids are going to try to touch everything, you yeah. know? And then you have to stop them to say, don't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, just make it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so my daughter just passed naked in front of the camera. Anyway, I'm going to put some blur uh, shape around their butt butt. So, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Welcome to the country of streakers. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so <laughs> kind of wild here. <laughs> I told you that my life is like this. So, anyway, funny, funny. Um, so, and then they call us again and again and again. Today, they said, we organized an hour for you guys. After so long, they, I think they, they, they were like, we have wow. to bring these people outside. So someone picked up um, us uh, in, yeah, one hour ago, and we went outside for 30 minutes. And actually, you just see fence, 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 fence everywhere. But it was good. It was good. So. They, and then we we got in and uh, one of the nurses just gave a big bottle for bubbles to, 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 to the daughters to play. It's it's nice. It's nice. You you when you can see this humanity thing in this kind of side, it's it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's I think it nice. looks quite I think it's quite different, you know, hotel to hotel in Australia, it's quite different state to state as well, I think. Um, yeah. Some hotels have balconies. Some I don't have a window that can open, for example. So I'm really in a box. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, me but too. Uh, you know, others have. Uh, in some places, they have. I know some hotels they will let guests out to swim in the hotel mm -hmm. pool for half an hour, or you know, out into some kind of rooftop terrace and they can walk around. You know, that sort of thing. Um, but the humanity touch is nice. It's the same thing. Like they phone every day here to get your food order for the day after. Um, and the first couple of days, it's it's all a bit stiff. But you know, turn the tables on them and ask them how they're doing, and they start talking to you. Nice. And um, so it is nice with a human touch in things, for sure. Good. So I think mm -hmm. we can we can close this topic quarantine and get in something more uh, exciting. So Australia, you have been in Australia b before, right? Yes, I am half Australian um, and I lived here for uh, four years while I did my biology studies. And I would have stayed. I'm a citizen down here. I would have stayed here except that I met a Swede. The rest so is you have, you have hunted already in Australia? Only once, actually, because oh. I started hunting after I moved to Sweden. And what was that experience in, in Australia? What type of hunt did you do? Oh, oh, oh. Let's, let's um, hear about it. No, I came down here and uh, I started off actually here in Perth, this side, and I went out um, with my brother and his best mate out to um, some properties where his best mate has the shooting rights on, where it's, you know, it's the feral animals that are the target. So it's the cats and foxes and that sort of thing. And that was just nice. It was a long time since I'd been out and slept in a swag under the stars by a fire, you know, under a massive gum tree. It was that was perfect, um, but the main hunt of that trip was a high country hunt for sambar deer. Wow. Um, it is to date the hunt of my life. I hope to top it, of course, but it was it was absolutely incredible. And that was also another social media success story. Actually, I was um, I came into contact with an Australian guy before that who was in England visiting relatives and stuff. And he 
was thinking about coming to Sweden, he posted in a forum and asked something about clothes. You know, it was one of these just random questions that I answered because I had the answer. And it landed up with him staying with us for a week and going on a bunch of driven hunts with us. He went on tracks with me. He got to shoot a ball with me. It's actually the first person I've taken to an animal. Um, he's an experienced hunter, but he'd never, you know, shot a European wild boar up there. And uh, so we had a great week and he got to see, you know, the way that, you know, the everyday hunting happens in Sweden, uh, you know, in a fantastic way. Um, it was a magic week. Um, and then a couple, uh, was it a year later, a year and a half later, then I came down here to see my brother and then I took a week and bailed over to that side and went sandbar hunting with him. And it was nice. awesome. He picked up in the middle of the night in Canberra and then we just legged it down to the high country and um, stayed out in the bush for a week. And a week. Uh, hard, hard, hard yards. We got up every morning, super early days, big hikes. Um, the worst shot of my life, given that it was a miss, but, um, and finally on the last day, last hunt, I got one on the deck. It wow. was amazing. What, what did you, what did you get? I just, it was I got a, a hind, a sambar hind. Yeah. So that is an introduced animal to Australia a long time ago. I don't know exactly when they were brought in. Um, there is a lot of deer in Australia. Um, none of which is endemic. Um, all of which are fantastic game animals. They're managed slightly differently in the different states. I'm not 100% up to date on, you know, all the rules and what's and how's of uh, where they're considered a game animal, where they're considered a pest animal, that sort of stuff. But so um, what, yeah. What type of deer is this like a really skittish deer, difficult to approach? Um, what what was the your strategy to, to get close to, 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 to one we, of those? glassing lots and lots and lots of glassing um so we were in quite big country to start with um and it was just a case of get out early like you were talking about rodeo you know when they move um they you know move down to feed and then they come up you know to day bed and stuff and uh basically just trying to get eyes on them um we did bump a couple at quite close range and i know a lot of hunters here do shoot them close range um but to give us a better chance of success, um, given that I wasn't experienced in that kind of hunting. Um, we were more aiming towards the heading onto faces, glassing off the other face, find the animals, make an approach if we needed to, and then take a shot like that. So it was much nice. longer range shooting than what I'm used to in Sweden um, and what is considered maybe correct in Sweden. But that's also a thing that, you know, different things work differently in different countries. Here, it's very normal to shoot at a couple of few hundred meters. Uh, in Sweden, it's not. Yeah, that's uh, true. As a general rule. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that so that was a case of, you know, moving out early, um, glassing, looking for them, looking for the opportunity, and then detour in the evenings again, and then downtime and sleep during the day, basically. Did you manage to taste the meat? You know what, I didn't. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it, you know. <gasps> It was, I mean, it, it's so beyond, I, I was so annoyed with myself afterwards, but it was just, you know, that whole week, we hunted so hard for that whole week. And when we finally got that animal on the ground, it was down in a gully and we had to pack it out. Um, which is also, I mean, we literally, we could, we were inclined like this, crawling yeah. along with the damn thing yeah. on our back in pieces. And, you know, we'd, we'd go for five minutes, sit down and it was boiling hot and, oh, you know, um, so I got back to camp that day and actually just went down to the low, to the nearest town. I had a bath in the river because, you know, I hadn't bathed for a week and we're just feral. And then, uh, <laughs> and then had dinner, got back to camp and just died. And then the day after, um, I was in a hurry. I had to get back to the airport. Wow. Uh, so I, didn't, I still haven't eaten a sambar, even though I've shot one. So probably there will be some samba deer in the upcoming days when you're, when you're a house. Oh, that would be nice. I doubt not this trip, I don't think, but I would love to get back to Victoria and hunt samba again. Yes. I would love to. Yeah. So um, let's get back to Europe and mm -hmm. uh, let's see a little bit your uh, type of uh, normal hunt. So which are mm -hmm. your hunts that you regularly uh, practice? Well, I mean, I hunt primarily to work my dog nowadays. Um, 
like I said, I have two dogs, but the one of them is sort of mine. She is uh, the Bavarian Mountain Hound. Um, she is a specialized tracking breed and I only use her for tracking on injured game. So mo not most, but a lot of the hunting I do is actually being there with her to help other people in the event that, you know, things don't go the way they want and um, the animal doesn't go down on the ground exactly when it should. Hmm. So I'll track them and uh, dispatch if necessary. I'll often work in teams with another dog, uh, a baying dog. Um, so, you know, you'll be two handlers, two dogs working to finish up something that maybe didn't go quite the way it should. Apart from that, I hunt with a, I'm not actually a member of a team myself because I travel around so much with the dog. Um, so, but I have, my husband is a member of two teams. So I hunt with his two teams often. And those are, you know, standard, you know, hunting permissions where there's a bunch of guys who get together and they run the hunts for the whole season. Um, and that's a couple of great guys um, or great teams. Um, and there it's your, your, you know, everyday driven hunt. Normally there'll be somewhere between one and three animals dropped in each of those hunts. And they go every, say, three weeks or so. And, you know, everyone catches up in the morning, big coffees, big chats, hangouts around the fireplace, you know, it's, yeah. So that, those are the two, two main things I do up there. Um, I do a bit of bird hunting every year with the German shorthead pointer. I was up in the, I know that, I'm not sure if it was you or someone else from from altitude and trails who was up and hunted hunted grouse in Lapland. It's uh, we went in. I went with Davide like a, three years, no, two years ago. Oh, and, okay. Uh, that was the last trip of altitude and trails in Lapland. Then uh, probably in the in the future, Davide is going to go back to Lapland again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we had a trip in September. To, I think yeah. two, two, two years ago, it was 2016, I think, two mm. years ago, I don't remember really well, but um, it was an amazing country there. Yeah, and I mean, I do that as well with the, with the GSP. Um, so I was up in Jämtland, which is the, the southern end of the Swedish mountain chain, in, um, oh no, not long ago, like a month ago, six weeks ago maybe, um, with ours and it's actually the first time I've shot grass over him I've shot pheasants and stuff over him before but it's the first time I've shot grass over him so that was magic it was beautiful in all its autumn beauty it was yeah, yeah. It's, it's just an amazing country there and um I'm interested a little bit to ask you some question about your trekking blood uh, Bavarian um mm -hmm. So we had we had a uh, Giorgio in our team. It's he has yeah. uh, he's the same type of breed, and um, I'm talked lastly with him, and he's still getting calls by hunters that are at this kind of uh, of uh, situation. So how often you get a call when when you're in Europe that during the hunting season? I mean it. It, it varies, but I mean, the main hunting season in Sweden where you do the driven hunts using driving dogs is from, with a couple of exceptions, from the 1st of October until the end of January. Um, so there, there's basically as much work as I want. I could do it full time if I want. That said, I don't do it to get paid. Um, so, you know, you do it and then maybe you get to hunt on the ground or something. And I do it to work my dog and because I love it. Um, but on a season where I've done a lot of work, maybe I would do 50 tracks in that three month period, 50, 60 tracks, something yeah, like that, a, I would say. But bad. I mean, you know, there's, um, I'm, I'm far from the most prolific, you know, track and dispatch hunter in Sweden. There's some guys that do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Um, you know, there's some people that do it full time. I don't. Um, but there, there are those who do. And especially if you look at some of the guys who do, who work with the traffic, the traffic hit animals, because there's a whole setup in Sweden where all big game that is hit by traffic um, yeah. gets tracked and dispatched. Um, they'll do hundreds of jobs a year, some of them. It's an incredible job they do. Nice, so, nice. Yeah. So they take care really of, of all the games in a good way. The management looks like nice or well-organized because I, I, during my thesis, I've seen that uh, the impact, car impact is the most frequent cause of that in wild games, especially we're talking about deers and, and goats, wild goats. 
more more on on the ears and uh yeah it, so it could be could be a problem if you're not managed well and there are some system to try to uh, uh, stop blocking the animals to go across the roads but you know the density sometimes some areas are a lot of animals so it's, it's impossible yeah. to, to... i mean i would say that you know the the hunting is the thing that is the main tool for for controlling how many animals there are in any given area um but you know the tracking work that is done after the animals are hit is that's not so much a control of the population it's more a case of okay this has happened how do we fix it in a lot of countries nothing happens at all yeah that's um, that's that's the point uh, yeah. yeah but here there is in sweden there's actually a legal obligation for the driver to phone in their their hit and then it goes through a formal setup to all the track and dispatch hunters um it's not always an easy job and not all the animals are found of course um but on the whole it's a good thing i mean it puts the animal out of its misery it also removes an injured animal from the road area and another traffic accident happening uh so there's you know a bunch of different different good yeah. things about that yeah. yeah the statistics are amazing um i don't know exactly off the top of my head but take a guess approximately how many accidents would you guess are reported in in sweden with bigger game in one year um 5000 65000 65000 yeah wow yeah. so the yeah. absolute majority of it is rodeo yeah yeah um That's i can actually way. get back to you and and i'll get you the actual numbers but i don't have the actual numbers i should wow. check them but i mean it's wow. massive amounts of animals um so yeah it's it's quite a big organization that way and that's one of the points that sometimes i get a little bit confused about you know this i don't want to get into this topic uh, um because it will open a big debate you know people they see it hunting like you know um a cruelty and uh you know stop hunting you know it's uh it doesn't make the population more healthy and, and blah 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 and they still pointing fingers to, to 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 the hunters. You like the hunters are just like a a, a bad thing. It's just a scene of humanity. It looks like sometimes you know when you speak with these people. But when we just check these numbers, mm. we should say the same things to all the drivers. We should say yeah. that stop you you with the car you 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 make more damages. Yeah. And, but I mean, also, not only that, you can also, you know, use the argument that, you know, if the populations weren't managed in some way, how many more car accidents would we have? Yeah. I mean, you know, okay, sure. I mean, death by car accident with a game animal is not, you know, a very common thing, but it does happen. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's this illusion that if you leave, you know, the natural world to do its own thing, it'll like fall back into its own kind of balance and look after itself. There are very few corners of the world left where, you know, the nature is in a position to balance itself nowadays because human influence and human, if, you know, what's the word effect? Um, I can think of the Swedish word, not the English word. Uh, it's there. There is no purely wild areas in most of the corners of the world, I would say, at least not where we're in the areas where people are having opinions about what we hunters do. You know, there's the great wild areas, but you know that's often not the areas where where these arguments are brought into play anyway. So yeah, yeah, that's it, we are part of nature, but you know, it's uh, I see hunting like a way to to get back to the nature. I'm trying to understand what is happening, yeah. Yeah. and um, let's get back. I love your narrative, and I want to know the best tracking that you have done with your dog. Oof. Um, there've been a few. I would say the one standout one is her breakthrough track. Um, the one that really sort of confirmed to me that we are a good team and that put her on the level of much better than average tracking dogs, you know, in the eyes of the people who are helped. Um, I just need to turn my phone off. Hang on a sec. No worry. The busy life of a lady in quarantine. Yep. Yep. Recep it was reception who wanted my food order for tomorrow. Um, no. So I, my tracking dog is my first hunting dog. I've had dogs before, but she was my first hunting dog. 
Um, as a general rule, I would say it's probably not that easy to get hold of a Bavarian mountain hound as someone who has no routine whatsoever in the field of track and dispatch. Um, as a breeder, I would also have been quite fussy about who I sold my dog to because they are such a specialized dog and they do require the right kind of hand and the right kind of work to, you know, come to their right. Um, but I was lucky I had a friend who was, who had one of these and she bred her. And so I got first pick of the litter after they themselves chose this. Um, but that also meant that I was quite green. I hadn't been hunting for that many years myself yet. Um, I had no kind of way of getting into that area of track and dispatch other than just being, you know, persistent myself and basically kind of forcing myself in wherever I saw a chance to get work for this dog and stuff. So I went on a couple of courses. Um, I did learn a whole bunch, but the last one I went on, I actually went more to network than anything else because I wanted to, you know, get my face out there and meet more people and, you know, find people who could possibly give me work. A couple of months after that course, one of the instructors phoned me up and he said, listen, I saw your dog work on the, on the course. Um, she was pretty good. I have a track that we have hit the wall with, with a bunch of other dogs and my normal tracker can't make it. Can you come and try? So I was like, all right, off I went. So um, I went off there and it was a boar that had been shot at. It was hit. There was a little bit of blood, not much. Um, and they had tracked it I think it was three dogs. I know it was two, but I think it was three that they'd already tried and tracked it with the day before. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it was messy. There had been people had walked all over the place. Of course, I can't see the mess, but I know that the, the scent, you know, picture that my dog is getting there is, you know, it's the hunter and it's the gun and it's the first dog handler, it's the second dog handler, and it's a beagle and it's a this, uh, you know. Anyway, um, so I put her to the track and um, this was about. It was, I, I don't think it was a full 24 hours after shot, but it was quite a way after shot. And um, we tracked and we passed where the first dog had lost the track. And then we passed where the second dog had lost the track because I had the guy who phoned me had been there for all the other track attempts. Um, and finally, when we passed, when all the dogs had lost the track, I was like, may this work. I just had to believe her oh. because there was nothing in the track. I couldn't see anything. And then after, we, I guess they, the first dogs had maybe got, I don't remember, three, 400 meters maybe. And then after we passed that point and maybe a hundred meters later and I found a drop of blood, I was like, wow. hallelujah. Um, wow. And then a few hundred meters after that, we found where the animal had bedded down, um, followed from there. And eventually I started seeing like a fresh drop. Um, so I'm like, all right, we pushed the animal out from yeah. its day bit um uh we aren't going to track into it uh because it was moving faster than we were so then the guy was with with me his name was nicholas he let his dog go who which is a routine baying dog um and we were that close that his dog went straight onto it put it up and he could dispatch um wow. so i suppose we got dispatched after about one and a half k's maybe which is a fairly standard distance for an animal that's still moving but it's quite hard hit um, but it was a difficult track. It was a very disturbed track. It was quite an old track. There was very, very little sign in the track. Um, and it was also, you know, it, we didn't really know where the injury was and stuff. It turned out that the gun had shot it, thought the animal, he thought the animal was facing the other way. So he'd shot it in the back quarter instead of the front quarter. So it was badly injured, but very, very mobile still. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I still remember that, like when I remember when he wrote on his Facebook, the other guy who called me in and he sort of praised the work that my dog had done. I was so proud that that really was a breakthrough for her and for me. Um, so I, I would say that one would have to be the one that's done it. But then we've had a few since then that we've done. Um, and some of them have been, I did one a couple of years ago where it was a, a similar situation, but a much longer track. I think we probably tracked four or five Ks on that one middle of the night, horrible weather, all the guys who were there stayed and just did exactly what I asked them to. It was amazing. I had, you know, one guy out there, one there, one doing garments, one putting, you know, paper strips on the track where I wanted marks, just an amazing team effort around it. 
and finally we found it you know a property away and several k's away in the middle of the night and finished up that one too um, and those are also the kind of things that you remember it's like damn that was good good teamwork good nice. dog work those you know good stories nice yeah. so as a, a breeder do you think that in general a dog can be excellent in what he's doing because there is a mental condition that is super healthy or super in a good status or is because his genetic is good so how much is doing is it's a difficult question but you know we so always hard. talk about as a vet i can tell you that always we talk about this is the son of and blah 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 we, we talk about a lot about the breeding uh, the morphology yeah. and but we never talk about the mental of a dog mm -hmm. and how much important it is especially when he get asked to get out of work and yeah. so what do you think about that it's well i mean just to clarify i'm not a breeder myself um but i think i mean of course it's important the mental aspects of a dog if i look at my dog for example she is not as she doesn't have as much mental thump as i would like her to have um, the problem is I don't know if it's because of how she is and what her mental sort of strength is, or if it's because I, as an inexperienced track, tracking dog handler, didn't give her the preconditions required to build that up in her early enough. Mm. Um, mm. But yes, it is very important, the mental side of it. It's uh, the genetics are not enough. I wouldn't say you definitely need to, you know, build the dog up and it's all, you know, and it, when you work so closely with her, I can talk to my dog through the tracking line. I can ask her what she's doing. I can ask her to just double check that she's on the right track. Um, but the only reason I can do that is because I've worked so much with her over the years that I can read her like a book. Um, but of course, I mean, the mental part is super important. So um, there is a type of language that you will, you will grow up between the man oh, and, and the and, oh, yeah. and the dog in general, because Absolutely. I've seen that when I have done some kind of uh, shooting photography for agility dogs. Mm -hmm. And every time that I was talking with the coach and uh, of the uh, French team, the national French team, um, and he said that most of the time when the dogs makes an error, it's just because the, um, I don't know what you call that, it's just the driver or the, yeah. Uh, yeah, we call the conductor in, in French, and uh, yeah. it does some mistakes. Some mistakes that could be like gestuality, could be the post posture of the body during that passage, and the dog get confused because mm. the dog is keeping an eye on 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 the person that is is uh, it's running with them. So, and I've seen even that with my dog that actually I don't really need to speak, I don't really need to say words, but there is a gestuality there is a, some kind of body language that they can understand so much faster than us yes and i mean the thing is i think for me when i'm working with my tracker as well um you know it took a few years but she knows that i want her to find an injured animal or in some cases on hidden on driven hunts there'll be more than one track to do off any given stand and she knows what she needs to do so it's really, I mean, the times that it's, that we have failed, uh, you know, the failing must be with me that I haven't seen when something has happened in the track. Um, it's very, very seldom, but it's happened a couple of times where she has just been like, no, I'm not tracking this, which is interesting. She did it once yeah. on a really, really big bore. She just sat in the track and looked at me and was just like, no way, I'm not doing that. Wow. Um, which was interesting, but you know, it, with her and the kind of work I do, she knows what I want her to do. It's up to me to see if she is looking at something else or is deviating, or I can tell from the way she tracks that, okay, suddenly there's not the same kind of um, direction and drive in the way she's, she's going on the line, which tells me that the animal's bailed off somewhere. And I need to give her a chance to back up and identify where the track has gone. Because, you know, wounded animals, they'll do backtracks and they will duck off to the side and they will circle around and they will do everything they can to throw you off. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, all the training with the dog is about learning to read her um, rather than instruct her. Yeah. Um, 
so what do you think uh, that a, a new a beginner hunter today that want to start to probably have a dog for tracking blood and want to try to what what is the uh, I mean a few things that probably could advise someone and want to start to have a type of dog for that type of activity what what do you think would be would be good to start well i mean i see this question a lot up in sweden and i think um the the, the background to it is that the, in sweden there is a legal requirement that you have to have a trained tracking dog within two hours of shot on on the bigger game um and a lot of people are like oh i want to train my dog to do track and dispatch um and most dogs can do most tracks um what what a person what you need to do is learn to read your dog learn to read what your dog is doing when they're not doing the right thing yeah. that's what training tracks are all about um and then if if we're talking someone who really wants to get really serious about it and do track and dispatch work for other people and stuff as well yeah. i mean there's two qualities that that person needs they need to have a lack of prestige super 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 important to know your own limitations and when you need to get help um and you need to be stubborn as all hell because you need to be able to go all night long if it comes to that yeah. those two things you have those and you train your dog it'll take you far nice this is a good quality actually probably even yeah. for other other types of uh, things in life yeah. in general yeah, yeah. <laughs> being stubborn I have a yeah. great saying in Sweden. They they talk about a thing called pannbein, which is the thickness of the bone on your forehead. It's like how hard can you hit your forehead against something until you know you get what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thick yeah. forehead bone I, is a good thing. <laughs> it's it, it's a super quote. I have to say, it's a super yeah. quote. Yeah. Yeah. So let's back. Let's go back a little bit. Um, Altitude and trails. Let's let's talk about that trip that you had recently on the Alps. On the uh, on the Alps in Italy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I remember that you we, we we have some short messages, but I I didn't I didn't figure out how to you know know a little bit more about your trip because you were really 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 close to our region in north yes. of Italy. Yeah. So where you have you been? so that was actually that was not a hunting trip at all um it was i have a bunch of girlfriends who are fantastic they are uh, power women of epic levels when it comes to work uh they are energetic and driven and the kind of people that just make you a better version of yourself so again they have this kind of uh, thickness uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they're the kind of girls you can't give them a challenge because they'll do it and do something else as well just for the hell of it but anyway we tend to do stuff together every now and then um so uh this time the mission was to tour mont blanc which is walking around the mont blanc massif on foot um or hiking it and then you're staying at refuges and all that sort of thing. I guess you would know what that is. Um, but you know, this lot decides the normal setup is that you do it in 11 days. They cooked it down to five. Um, wow. <laughs> so, anyway, so there were, there was a bunch of us and we were all going to do it together. Um, for various reasons, I had a look at the final planning of it and I was just like, you know what? I cannot do 35, 40, sometimes more than 40 Ks a day, 2,000 meters up, 2,000 meters down, carrying all my packing five days in a row without hurting myself. I could do it based on the thickness of my forehead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it wouldn't have been enjoyable and it would have hurt. Um, so sort of going severely against my own pride, I said to them, I'm like, look, uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. But I had my tickets. So we finally landed at the sort of conclusion that I would be ground crew for them, um, which is fine. You know, they're good friends of mine. And if it makes life easier for them and I get an awesome, you know, a few days trekking around far out of the way, valley heads and stuff at the base of Mount Blanc for a few days, I can do that. So I picked up a car and then I met them every day. Um, and sometimes I would meet them halfway and open up the booth and I'd have lunch laid out for them in the booth. And it wow. also meant that they didn't have to 
you know, carry everything with them, which they wouldn't have had to do otherwise. Yeah. But the amazing yeah. thing about that was that, you know, it's a beautiful piece of countryside. Um, it's very easily accessible. We flew into Geneva and then just hired a car from there and you're right there. Um, but because they were staying in the refuges that were sort of way up in the heads of valleys that you wouldn't normally get to, I got to out of the way places that I would have never seen otherwise. And I joined them on some of the legs and then walked back to the car myself and then went and picked them up and stuff. Um, mm. So it was incredible. I mean, it's amazing countryside. I mean, one of the valley heads we stayed in at a refuge just way up at the end of no man's land. Um, the road was that narrow and that, you know, up on one side, down on the other side. And they closed it from either direction at any given point because it was too narrow to pass. Um, so, you know, I'm driving my car, I'm like, don't look down, don't look down. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, but it was incredible. And it was, you know, once I'd sort of put my own pride to one side and been like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do that this time. It was awesome. You know, caught up with them at the end of every day. And then I sort of came in with heaps of new energy at the end of the day when they retire. And, uh, picked up stuff they needed if they had stuff so it was a it made the trip easier for them and I could still do it and be in a good place nice so that nice. was great it, it was very very nice no nice. so it's really amazing to see that to follow a little bit your lifestyle it's uh, so energetic and uh wow full full of surprises every time well, and uh, from you oh come <laughs> I mean, on suddenly you rock come up on. on the other side of the world <laughs> yeah just like this you know i didn't know what to do well <laughs> and and let's let's uh, um get to the um, uh final minutes so best expedition best hunting expedition that you have experienced since the beginning of your hunting life mm. any which Ooh. country Oh, that's so hard. So hard, so hard. Uh, it's, it's super hard. Um, well, uh, I've already talked about the Australian one. I would say the sandbar takes the cake, but I've already talked about that one. So, um, so yeah, I kept the, the, the series for, for the last. Uh, oof, uh, maybe, 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 uh, maybe actually the grass hunting I did now, just recently with my own dog. Nice. Yeah. It's your and, you know, the the thing that was nice about that it was a last minute thing as well. Um, I have the luxury of being quite flexible with my time at the moment. And um, I looked at the weather. I got hold of someone who had grounds up there. And I was like, look, can I just grab the days that work? Um, and she was like, sure. And I was like, hmm, OK, can I bring someone with me? I landed up taking a non-hunter with me, um, mm. which who's an, he, you know, he enjoys the outdoors. He's a food maniac, um, but a non-hunter. And, you know, it was autumn sweden mountains in its absolute glory um and you probably saw some of the photos on my instagram it was incredibly beautiful um and the dog worked well and i shot well and the guy got to eat you know freshly taken down grouse a quarter of an hour after i'd taken off the wing um it was it was like it's, it's a good friend of mine and to be able to introduce a person to hunting like that and at the same time have like like shooting grass over a pointing dog in the mountains there's something kind of pinnacle about that yeah. and to do that over my own dog in that environment and show somebody else look this is the kind of thing we get to do how awesome is this um that's uh, that was a good one too nice nice yeah. so um as we uh we had a little briefing and you mentioned that mm -hmm. there is a, a funny story between your nickname on Instagram yes. and uh, let, let's hear about that and we, f we finish with this because like wow I, I make a stay hours with you just listening to all your different you know experiences it's like wow you, you should write a book you know a lot Why? of people tell you... me write, write a book <laughs> yeah that would be amazing and your wow your, your narrative it's just amazing amazing yeah I mean, kids, uh, did, did, did you experience something like that with kids that just look at you and stay stuck, you know, staring and just keep hearing um, your, your your stories? I'm mostly adults, actually. 
I don't know if it means that there's a small child in all of us, but <laughs> exactly that's what I said. I mean, probably because I, I'm 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 dealing with my girls, and and they always ask me about stories and stories and stories. I mean, the the, the older one. Um, I like I'm I'm a communicative person. I like I like you know messages and storytelling and stuff. Um, but yeah, so my name, Chili Thief. Um, it is an English translation. English is my home language, of course. I speak Swedish fluently, but um, it is an English translation of a word, a nonsensical word, chili-rövare, which um, I guess would more correctly be translated to chili bandit. Okay. Um, okay, the backstory to this is I shot my first hare driven by a hound that I thought was a chili-rövare, which is a breed of hare hound up in Sweden. Um, much excitement. I got home, told my young daughter about this. This was probably, oh, must be eight or nine years ago or something. Mm -hmm. More even. Um, and I said to her, oh, I'm in Schillestover. As it happens, it wasn't a Schillestover. I thought it was at the time. Anyway, so I told her that. A few weeks later, she's looking in a, in a, um, a dog magazine and there's a picture of a puppy. And she's like, oh, mom, 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 is that one of those Schillestover that you shot? your hair in front of. Um, so in Swedish, if there's any Swedish listeners, I'll say it like this. It's like, mama, mama, there must you want a chili rover or something called a hair in for. So in Swedish, it was like, she invented this really funny name for, you know, a dog that didn't exist. And I just thought it was cute. So my That's first so name cute. was chili rover, the Swedish one. And then when I decided to turn my Instagram account into English instead, then I just translated it. Amazing. So that. So that's why I'm Amazing. called Chitty Thief. Amazing. Yeah. So guys, now you know, it will be your name, your nickname on the description. So guys can go and follow your stories. It's your experience, your life a little bit because it's a super exciting. So thank you so much. That was a super window to, you know, an interest lifestyle. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, hope you all, you guys are going to enjoy this episode. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.